OK, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks to everyone that's joining us live and uh, also to anybody that's watching this back as a recording. This will be on our YouTube channel um, almost straight away, hopefully from tomorrow. Um, we've got uh, some slides to go through to go through the process and have a look at the shortlisting scoring areas. And then we'll have hopefully some time for quite a lot of Q&A at the end. If you have questions during the session, please stick them in the, in the chat in the Q&A. Um, I will try and answer some as we go, but we'll also obviously go through some with our um, panelists as well at the end of it. So we've got two people that are going to be speaking today. We've got Eloise Rogers, who's our uh, recruitment coordinator here at the college that manages the uh, subspecialty recruitment process. Uh, and we've also got Dr. Kay Tyman, who's a TPD up in Yorkshire and Humber. Uh, she's most recently been our assistant officer for recruitment uh, and is just moving over now to take over as our workforce officer. So without further ado, I will hand over to Eloise um, and we'll uh, we'll give you some info about this year's process. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Eloise, the medical recruitment coordinator, and I'm going to be uh, taking you through a presentation on the subspecialty training applications. So I'm going to start by talking about what's new for the next recruitment round and then I'll go through the timeline and the overall recruitment process and then we're going to focus on the shortlisting part of the process and then go through the assessment areas for shortlisting and interview and then I'll hand over to Dr K Tarman who will talk through the shortlisting score sheet and then we'll have a presentation from a trainee, uh, a community child health trainee, and then we'll end with the Q&A. So new for the next round, so post starting in 2023. So I'm sure you're all aware that Progress Plus will be implemented in summer 2023. So some of you may be wondering how it will affect you. So we have uh, lots of information on the RCPCH website, which should help you. We have a Progress Plus and Me flyer, and that explains how each level uh, training will move through the programme and it will have details on the subspecialty applications as well. We also have some information on getting your neonatal and community experience with Progress Plus and we have an informative YouTube video on how Progress Plus will impact you and your application and so all that information can be found uh, on the link there to the Progress Plus page. So the changes for shortlisting, the score sheet has uh, the scoring has uh, stayed the same on the score sheet, but we've got less emphasis on the quantity and where experience was had. So, for example, at whether experience was at local, regional, national or international level, and they've put more of the emphasis on the quality of the experience and trainees understanding in the assessment areas. We will also be holding wash up sessions with the shortlisters after they've scored the applications to review the scores and comments before they're released to applicants. And that's um, what we do after the interviews as well. The confirmation of eligibility forms are on Kaizen this year. And they do not need to be attached to your application. The interviews will be virtual again, but we're going to be using the assessment platform OSLA for the interviews and also for the reception. So there will just be one uh, piece of software needed this year, whereas previously we used Practique and MS Teams. On the screen, you can see all the subspecialties that are recruiting this year. 
So there's just two subspecies which are not in this round. So that's child mental health and clinical pharmacology. So this is the timeline from now. So the programmes were advertised last Wednesday. You can go to our website and the applicant guidance page to see all the available posts. And they're at the bottom of the web page in the download section. And the job descriptions are available through a link on SharePoint. The applications will open in Oriel next Wednesday. And the confirmation of eligibility forms, which you fill out through your ePortfolio, need to be with the deanery by Monday the 7th of November at the latest. And that's the latest it needs to be with the deanery, not the latest that it's then submitted to us. The applications then close at 12 noon on Wednesday the 16th of November. And shortlisting will be completed by the 7th of December. And the outcomes for that and invites to interview are then sent out to all the applicants from Wednesday the 14th of December, and that's through Oriel. And they're sent out at the same time. The interview period is two and a half weeks, and that's from Thursday the 19th of January to Friday the 3rd of February. And those individual uh, dates for each subspecialty will be available on the website very soon. The deadline for confirmation of preference choices is Friday the 3rd of February, so that's at the very end of the interview period. And the first round of offers will be released via Oriel from Tuesday the 14th of February and then we finally hold a clearing round from Friday the 24th of February and that's for any posts not filled and, and, and we contact any applicants that were not offered any preferences, any of their offers. So before you apply, this is for UK trainees. You need to fill out the confirmation of eligibility form. And as I said already, this um, is on ePortfolio this year and you need to make sure it's with your deanery by the 7th of November. And how to fill out the form. So you log into your ePortfolio, you create a new event and you find the confirmation of eligibility form under and uncategorized. So that's usually once you scroll to the bottom of the page read through the instructions and you need to fill out section one of the form so that's all you'll have access to anyway and once you've completed section one you then submit it to your local deanery contact and that's found on our website if you are applying later in your training and counting uh, previous level three training experience towards your application and you've contacted the CSAC chair about that, you need to attach that approval email to your confirmation of eligibility form. So once you then submit it to your deanery, your head of school or TPD contact will fill out section two and submit it back to us. And then we'll then finalise the process by confirming receipt of the form through Kaizen. And as I said, you do not need to upload it to your application form. So for non UK trainees, this is for uh, anaesthetic trainees, intensive care medicine trainees and emergency medicine trainees. So your confirmation of eligibility form is an attachment on the RCPCH website. So that needs to be completed um, by your deanery and emailed back to the subspecialty team. And you can see the email address on the screen. For Irish trainees, you need to complete the Certificate of Level 2 Paediatrics Training for Republic of Ireland trainees, and that's located on the website as well. And that needs to be filled out by a consultant that has worked with you for a minimum of three months, whole time equivalent within three and a half years prior to the start date of the post you're applying for and sent back to the subspecialty team. So applications open in Oriel from next Wednesday. 
and they close at 12 noon on Wednesday the 16th of November. If you haven't already got an Oriole account, uh, this is something you can set up now. You won't be able to open up an application or fill out any of that till next Wednesday, um, but uh, please make sure you have an account ready. If you've already got an account, uh, that's fine. You don't need to create another one, but it's just if you haven't got one already. So you can check that by going to the link there and um, yeah, checking if you've got an account or if you need to make a new one. So how to apply? So uh, the applications are in Oriel. You'll need to have three references ready and um, have that in there. And the word count will be listed in the application as well. So uh, the word count is quite substantial, quite generous for each of the questions. You do not need to fill the word count. We're not looking for you to make sure you fill the maximum. Uh, format, there's uh, with the formatting with Oriel, you can't do anything fancy to it and you won't be able to add bullet points in Oriel, but we would suggest that you write your answers to the questions outside of Oriel in Word or in Notebook and then copy and paste it back into Oriel. So you can include paragraphs and what you will be able to see is also what the assessors will see. Uh, just a reminder there on plagiarism, applications have to absolutely be your own and not the same as anyone else applying. It has to be your own words. Um, and please submit at least 48 hours before the closing date. And this leaves enough time if there's any technical issues or anything you're unsure about, please contact the subspecialty team before uh, so we can uh, make sure we we can help you with that in enough time and late applications will not be accepted under any circumstances. So once it's 12 o'clock on the deadline, you won't be able to submit it. The shortlisting process. So the shortlisting panels are made up of four consultants from the subspecialty that you're applying for. The largest subspecialty, so that would be uh, neonatal medicine, community child health, PICM and PEM. Uh, those are uh, with those subspecialties, they split the applications between two panels of three assessors. So each of those um, two panels score uh, half the questions for all the applicants. The personal details and equal equal monitoring data is removed from the applications form, so all the applications are anonymous. The applications will then be ranked according to your shortlisting scores and then a cut of score for invites to interview will be set and that's based on the overall possible appointments. Shortlisting outcomes and invites to interview. So all applicants will be notified via oral from Wednesday the 14th of December on whether they've been shortlisted or not. And if they've been shortlisted, they'll also receive an invite to interview. And that's done simultaneously. So if you are invited to interview, your invite will contain the interview date. Uh, smaller subspecialties would just have one date and if it's one of the larger subspecialties there'd be multiple dates and candidates will be able to choose and book the time of the interview through the Oriel system at that point and it's done on a first come first serve basis. It will also contain the duration and the structure of the interview. Shortlisting scores and feedback. So applicants can view their total shortlisting score in the app, uh, application summary in their oral account. So once uh, shortlisting has been completed and you've received your shortlisting outcome, you'll be able to see your total score. So there's an example there on the screen. So you just have to click on shortlist 
on the progress tracker and you'll be able to see your score and what it's out of underneath. And all applicants, whether you've been shortlisted or not, will be emailed a breakdown of your scores from each of the assessed domains, the overall score and any comments that the panel have left. And that will be by Wednesday, the 23rd, the tw sorry, 21st of December. And that overall score in Oriol will always be there as well, so you can see that at any point. Interview outcomes. Candidates must achieve a minimum of 60% in their interview score to be found appointable. It is possible, however, though, um, for candidates who score above 60% not to be appointed by the panel if there are any serious concerns, for example, patient safety. So if they're raised during the interview process in one or more of the candidates, so any of these candidates marked with these serious concerns will be discussed by the interview panel along with the lay chair and the subspecialty recruitment team. And they will review the interview score sheets and make a decision as to whether the candidate should be found appointable or not. All candidates who have been interviewed will be contacted by the college by email to be told if they've been successful or not in their interview from Tuesday the 14th of February. The office process. So the office process only starts once all the interviews are complete. Applicants are given a ranking and the offers are released based on your placing within this and also your preferences. The first iteration of offers is from Tuesday the 14th of February and you'll then have 48 hours to decide what you want to do with your offer. So it's possible to just accept the offer if you've been given your first choice or accept with upgrades if you've perhaps given your second or third choice or, or further. You can hold the offer up until the whole deadline or you can decline it if it's just not suitable at all or if you've changed um, what you're going to do. Usually there are several iterations of offers over a couple of weeks. On the screen you can see the assessment areas. So there are seven assessment areas for shortlisting and the interviews there are four different assessment areas. I'm now going to hand over to Dr Kay Tarman, who will talk through the shortlisting score sheet. Thank you, Eloise. So I'm going to um, overview all the domains in the shortlisting. So the first domain is clinical experience. <clears throat> and in this domain, you're asked to describe your clinical experience to date and skills that you have acquired that are significant and specific to your subspecialty application. And this includes details of transferable skills and your overall approach to patient care in both an acute and non-acute setting. It's important to note that additional marks may be awarded within the scoring range to answers that show a greater depth of understanding of the relevant subspecialty that you're applying to and also evidence of a holistic patient-centered approach. And likewise, somebody who gives multiple examples will not necessarily score highly if the applicant didn't look back to link back to the relevant subspeciality, transferable skills and their own development. And this section is scored from zero to six. So um, we wouldn't expect anybody to get zero for no evidence. But a mark of one is where there's a generic description of training so far, but little relevance to subspeciality and little attempt to explain relevance of skills. Whereas the maximum mark of six would be given where there's more than two specific and significant examples of skills gained throughout training to date with relevance to the subspeciality with own development clearly explained. 
Um, again, I'd like to stress that you don't necessarily need to have undertaken a rotational post in this subspeciality, but we're looking for applicants to link experiences that they've had in the training to date in general paediatrics, neonates and community um, and relate those to the subspeciality that they are applying for. Next slide, Eloise. So in the next section, we're looking at quality improvement and audit, and you're asked to describe your involvement in a quality improvement project or audit and provide evidence where you've identified an opportunity for quality improvement and subsequently looked to improve clinical effectiveness, patient safety or the patient experience. And we want you to tell us your specific level of involvement with each stage in a project. Highlight what has changed as a result of your project and describe what you have learned about the quality improvement or audit process. You should note that the scoring below applies to quality improvement or audits that you have designed and led individually, but it's acceptable for you to have done this with the support of a senior trainee or consultant. So again, participation in relevant clinical projects where you've not designed or led the quality improvement project or audit would get to one mark, where if you have designed and led more than one good quality project with a clear description of subsequent changes in local practice guidelines that has been adopted for one of the examples at a regional or national level, you would get four marks. At the end of the application form, there is a glossary where there's definitions for each section. So for example, there'll be a definition as to what we mean by designed and led. Next slide, please, Eloise. So the third domain looks at leadership, management and experience. Um, and I'd like to point out firstly that any teaching and educational experience should be evidenced and scored within the teaching section and not in this section. So in this section, you're asked to describe clearly any leadership, managerial or organisational contribution that you've made in your professional life. And this can be both at an undergraduate or postgraduate level. It can also be outside of the workplace if you can link it back to your clinical role. And be sure again to state your exact individual contribution, what you've achieved um, and the time commitment involved in undertaking this role. The marking scheme for this section has changed slightly from previous years. So there's the emphasis into your personal input rather than whether something's been undertaken specifically at a local, regional, national or international level. So accordingly, if you've been involvement, involved in rotor organisation within a department, you will be allocated one mark. Whereas if you've had a leadership or management or organisational role at a local, regional, national or international level where you've held a significant responsibility and been able to demonstrate regular contributions and commitment with clearly described evidence of the impact that you have made and what you've learned from this experience, you would get the full four marks. Next slide, Eloise. So in research achievements, you are asked to outline the areas of research in which you have been directly involved at an undergraduate or postgraduate level. And when you describe your research related experience, please state your role and the level of rec recognition the research outcomes have achieved. Again, I'd like to point out that this um, includes research undertaken at undergraduate or postgraduate level with the guidance of a clinic or clinical or academic supervisor. And again, audit and QI should be evidence and scored in the QI audit section and not under the research achievements. So the marking for this scheme is shorter, but you can see limited research experience would get you one mark. Whereas if you've been involved in a research project of a high standard with significant input, which has achieved regional or national recognition, you get four marks. And again, there's definitions in the glossary section. Next slide, Eloise. The publications, presentations and posters section hasn't changed from last year. 
we encourage you to anonymise um, any um, lists of um, presentations or publications, but your marks will not be decreased if you leave your name in the publication lists. So again, for one mark, if you've had at least one of the following, a single case report, letter published in a peer reviewed journal, oral presentation, first author post at a national meeting or co-author post at an international meeting, that would get you one mark. Whereas if you've got evidence of more than one peer reviewed publication, excluding case report or book chapters as, as a first author, you would get four marks. Next section, Eloise. So in this section, we look at involvement in teaching and you're asked to describe your experience of teaching or education delivery and different teaching methods that you have used. Again, please detail any contribution to the design and delivery of teaching and education that you've been involved with and describe the exact contribution in each area that you've made. You can include any details of formal teaching that you've undertaken, such as the Teach the Teachers or GIC or equivalent course or some of you may have undertaken a diploma in postgraduate medical education. The first three points in the section are awarded for involvement in teaching, and a further point can be gained if a formal qualification in teaching or education has been completed. So it's a maximum of four points for the section, and you must have completed the course and qualification, not just registered or have recommendation for instructor status to qualify for the additional point. And next slide, Eloise. And finally, there's an overall statement to support your application. And in this section, we're looking for you to pull all the, your evidence together to show your commitment to your subspeciality and your enthusiasm for this area. So please outline your career aims and motivations along with any additional information you would like to provide to support your application. And as I've said, we're looking for particularly for demonstration of commitment and any particular personal attributes that you feel are suitable towards your chosen subspeciality um, and would translate into your future career. So in this section, again, if you've stated some motivating factors, but these are more general and not specific to your chosen subspeciality, you'd get one mark, where if you pull together an excellent description of motivation and experience to date, which clearly shows that you've got an in-depth understanding of the subspeciality that you're applying for and commitment, and you're able to describe a potential future career path, that would get you four marks. Thank you. I'll hand back to Eloise at this section. Thank you, Kay. So we're now going to move on to tips on a successful application and also tips on um, doing a virtual interview. And we have a community child health trainee called Monica, and I've got a recording of her um, talking through and sharing some of these tips and her experience of um, applying to community child health. Do allow me to start by saying that applying for some specialty training was one of the best training related decisions I've ever made. Um, that's obviously alongside choosing to train in paediatrics in Yorkshire and choosing community child health. Um, it really allowed me to tailor my training according to my interests, shape my own path in a way, um, whilst doing um, working in an area of paediatrics that I really love. Um, and I was one of few fortunate trainees um, placed in a community paediatrics job in level one, having had no prior knowledge of this uh, and therefore had the chance to experience the work directly. However, you don't need to have done a placement in your subspecialty to be successful at application and interview. But what I think you need to be very clear about is why do you want to train in this area of paediatrics? And also, what will you add to the field? How will your contribution enhance the subspecialty. Um, and when I went through this thinking process before applying, I really considered three points. First of all, do I like the job? Do I like what consultants are doing? 
um, as part of the job plan, the setting where I'm likely to be uh, working in, the road I'm likely to cover uh, and so on. Um, then I ask myself, do I like the people I'm going to be working with? And this is including the children and families we look after uh, and the team working in my subspecialty. Um, and I would encourage you to get to know some of the people working in your area, uh, speak with consultants and current grid trainees, learn about what they do, what interests them and um, see if your interests fit with um, with the big picture. Um, the third um, important point I ask myself is, do I find the medicine interesting? Um, for example, do you suddenly light up with interest when a case is being discussed in the general handover and want to know more? Um, I often find myself wanting to know much more than the specifics of their chest infection treatment um, in children with medical and neurodevelopmental complexities coming through the acute pediatrics ward when I'm on call. Um, I want to learn about their baseline condition, their progress so far. I want to know their story and how this intercurrent illness fits with the bigger picture. Um, is there a need for parallel planning? How we involve learning disability team? Um, whilst I deal with the acute question being asked, I am keen to offer children holistic care and integrate it into the big picture, which really fits with how a community pediatrician thinks. And these um, sorts of thinking um, processes will, will apply to other subspecialties as well. I think these points that are specific and relevant to you need to feature in your application. Um, because we spend a big part of our adult lives at work, um, colleagues are like a second family. Patients and families we look after um, make the job meaningful and interesting. And, and really ask yourself, can you see um, yourself working in the subspecialty, doing the job and enjoying it for the rest of your career? Um, as I was getting involved in more and more uh, projects in community child health, that's exactly how I felt. This was who I wanted to be. Um, now some practical points about the application. Um, speak to current grid trainees in your subspecialty in your area. It gives you an idea of the level of experience of a successful applicant and how they evidence their skills and interests. Um, the Royal College of Specialty Training page has lots of information um, and we've listed some of them earlier. Um, look at the application documents early. I would argue look at them 12 to 18 months before you're even going to apply. Um, go through each section of the scoring sheet as Dr. Tyman has just done. Uh, think about the type of training activity you could include to score maximum points, which is your weakest area and what can you do to improve this weak area. Um, and when you write the application, I would say just let your passion and enthusiasm shine through. There are so many transferable skills in pediatrics that most things you've done can apply to your area of interest, even if not done directly linked with this area of interest. Um, have a good understanding of the subspecialty. Read the le relevant level three subspecialty curriculum for your um, area of interest, um, just to get an overview on what to expect from a career in that subspecialty and um, what particular personal attributes and skills will fit well with this career. Um, when you list your previous experience in each domain um, and describe the projects you've done, um, and, and Dr. Tamar has actually uh, touched on this, really emphasize on the impact your projects have had. Have you changed something for the better? Either is patient experience and care better because of your project? Uh, is service delivery more streamlined? Is there better training? Um, has the project changed you as a doctor and how? Um, which I think really equates to what excellent relevant skills are you bringing to the table and why are you a suitable and desirable person for the job? Um, make the people reading the application really want to know you and work with you and get them excited to see your future contribution to the subspecialty, I think is the general idea. Um, and I know now your focus is on the first step, on the application. Um, and uh, I know there's a separate webinar on interview skills planned later on. Um, I also wanted to give you a few very quick tips on interview preparation from my experience as well. Um, really familiarize yourself with the content and the structure of the interview. Just know what to expect. Don't be flustered on the day because you didn't expect a certain thing to happen. Um, then the next thing would be to prepare some clear structured answers to different types of common questions um, using examples from your projects and experience. Um, 
really to support the fact that you not only know the theoretical answer to the question, but you have applied the concepts in practice, um, leading to some positive outcome for you or others. But do remember that the interview panel would not have seen your application uh, or the shortlisting score. Therefore, tell them about uh, your relevant experience and skills that link with the question being asked. Um, you'll not be prompted very much unless you veer off course a lot. So um, be prepared to have a structured answer for questions that you're being asked. Um, do as much interview preparation as you can with colleagues, supervisors, current green trainees, consultants, um, and I would say practice online to make it as close to the virtual interview as possible. Um, a lot of people find the technology aspect very frightening, and I think good preparation will alleviate these fears. Make sure you have optimized your equipment, your environment, and how you present yourself on the day. Um, for example, make sure you have a good enough computer, camera, microphone, Wi-Fi connection to do the job and try out your connection in the space you will use with the device you're going to use on the day. Um, ensure you have protected time off, um, a private space that will not be invaded by children or um, pets or anyone else. Um, you have a tidy background behind you and I would say just wear comfortable smart clothes like you would in a face to face interview. Treat most of it as, as a usual face to face interview. Um, the, the software practice is very straightforward to use, to be honest. Um, and on the day, just try and relax um, and enjoy meeting some people working in your subspecialty. Um, engage with them, although they are um, little images on the screen and, and share some of your passion with them. These might be people that you're looking up to, people that you've heard in conferences or um, have have taught you something uh, in your preferred subspecialty. Um, I think your your bigger biggest challenge is to show the best version of yourself on the day. Um, good luck, everyone. OK, so this now brings us to the Q&A. So I'm just going to bring up the final slide of the presentation. And you can see the, the links on there. So for more information on the guidance and find all the forms, you just go to the RCPCH website and um, go to the subspecialty training application guidance page. There's also more information on all the subspecialties on the link you can see there. You can also get to that from the applicant guidance page and uh, see the link on the right hand side. The link I shared at the beginning on Progress Plus and me and all the guidance to do with Progress Plus is there again. And if you do have any questions uh, after this meeting, then please email the subspecialty team at subspecialty at rcpch.ac.uk. And I think some people have been putting uh, questions into the chat, but please do keep adding those in. And I'm going to hand over to James now, who's going to lead on the Q&A. Thanks very much, Kay and Eloise, um, for those very hopeful slides and explanations. We have indeed got some questions. Um, I think before we go into the questions, the last question that's popped up in the chat is very much around kind of whether people should uh, apply to subspecialty training this year or not with a sort of view to being perhaps SD4 with Progress Plus coming in next year. So I wonder if we could just uh, pass quickly to Kay just for a little sort of uh, general overview really of, of kind of advice around uh, applying this year if you're not sort of uh, quite sort of clearly SD5 and above. Thank you very much, James. So essentially, if you are applying this year, you need to expect to have your level two training signed off by ARCP in summer 23. Um, you also will have needed to, to have cleared your clinical exam by really the last sitting in, in, in October now. So you will not be able to apply this year if you haven't undertaken and cleared your clinical exam by the October sitting. 
you are allowed to defer start date um, for your grid posts for statutory leave or if you're undertaking a higher degree, but you can't defer your start date if you've just like started ST4 and then gone on statutory leave and not actually had your level two training signed off um, by summer 23. So if you defer, you'd be expected to be in a position to be able to go straight into your subspeciality post when you come back into training. Um, and one other key point probably to discuss just as we transition to Progress Plus. So any trainee who's in their ST4 year at some point between September 22 to September 23, will have the ability to decide whether or not they want to progress to the ST5 of progress in September 23 or remain in core training for an extra year. And so if you are potentially, say, your ST4 trainee now, but you are going on statutory leave, you will retain that ability to keep your current CCT date um, and opt to remain an extra year in core when you come back into your training programme. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kay. That's that's very helpful. Uh, so a lot of these will probably be fairly personalised. So the, the main bit of advice is speak to your own supervisor, TPD first. And if there's any sort of um, um, anything that's not clear after that, then then come to us uh, in the subspecialty recruitment team. Um, I've got a couple of questions around the new confirmation of eligibility form and uh, being used on the ePortfolio, which I'm going to pass to LOE. So first of all, someone's talking about not being able to see the subspecialty eligibility form on their ePortfolio, um, and they're just wondering why that may be. Um, and a second part to that from a separate question is, do, uh, do trainees need to wait for the deanery to reply about their eligibility form before they submit their application? Thanks. So I'll answer the first bit first. It may be you can't see the confirmation of eligibility form on your ePortfolio because you don't have a location against your ePortfolio. So obviously if you're in, I don't know, the West Midlands, for example, you won't be able to find anyone because you haven't got West Midlands down as your location. That's quite a simple fix. Uh, we just have to add that location to your ePortfolio. So please send an email to subspecialty at rcpch.ac.uk and just let us know if if you can't see it and we'll check your location it may just be you haven't got one and we'll add that on um and so the second part of the question we um so as i said there is uh, the deadline that we need that the confirmation of eligibility form has to be with your deanery by it needs to be um, with them by that date and if it's not then it's up to them uh, whether they would accept it or not and then it needs to be with us by the point that you submit your application so if you're if you haven't received uh, so you'll know if if we've then received it back because we confirm um receipt of it through ePortfolio and you can kind of follow it the status of the form kind of updates at, at each stage and says where it is so if you've got any concerns just email us uh near the time because that will be part of the long listing process that you have filled out a confirmation of eligibility form so it needs to be filled out by the deanery and with us by the uh, application deadline. Thanks, always. Yeah, so essentially, if when we start long listing, we see that we haven't received any, then we'll be able to chase you as well. But if you let us know before that, that would be great. Um, OK, we've got a few questions around some of the sort of shortlisting points, if that's all right. The first one is around the GIC point. Do you need to have done just the GIC uh, course or done two times IC post course? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say that um, if you've done the GIC course, that will get you an extra point. But obviously you will find it much easier to evidence the previous three points if you've actually participated and um, been an instructor on a course. Thank you, Kay. Um, so question here about um, involvement in examples. So to what depth must we outline our involvement uh, for example, in areas like QI audit and research, 
i.e. or e.g. to highlight how we designed led some work. Should we state that we've registered the project um, or do most of the data collection or analysis, etc.? Or can we primarily state that we designed and led the audit QI work? I would suggest that probably more, the more detail as to how you designed and led the better, but. Yeah, I mean, we need to see evidence of how you've designed and led it. So, you know, we you need to sort of give that information in your answer. So you might talk about how you set about, you know, setting the primary, secondary outcomes, um, and then what role you had in terms of data collection, um, analysis, um, and reporting the results of your project. Thank you. Um, and a question here, just talking about, I suppose, just uh, considering the various different sort of criteria for different scores. The question is, do I need to evidence lower points experience in a shortlisting domain if I have higher points experience? So it, it depends, obviously, um, which section you're referring to, but really in the first few sections, um, you know, to be evident from your answer at which level you will be scoring. So um, I would imagine for your clinical experiences, um, for QI, sort of education leadership, really the, the level of your answer will determine where your score, um, whereas if you get to sort of, you know, um, publications, presentations. Um, again, you know, you don't have to sort of have done everything to get one mark to then be able to get sort of two marks later on. It is the level to which you you have done that section and evidence that section. Um, thank you very much. And a question about research as well. Overseas research as part of MD part of an MD, sorry, are they counted as research experience or can Yeah, they so it's anything that you've done at an undergraduate or postgraduate level, but it, you know, it's not enough just to say I have done this. You've got to, you know, show what that in, involved and and the role that you played in that research. Thanks. I think that's key for quite a lot of those sort of sections, isn't it, really? That, yeah, it's it's knowing the involvement that you've had uh, and the effect on it. That's kind of the key thing that will get you high marks. Um, and can any teaching experience be used as leadership crossover or will it automatically be discounted, e.g. organising a large scale teaching event and overseeing a team? Yeah, so that could be used towards leadership. Um, but um, I think you have to be careful not to duplicate evidence between sections. Absolutely. Um, Eloise, a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, around uh, applying to uh, the CSAC to count training that you've done in the past. So this uh, particular person is an SD5 and done tertiary neonates for a year at 60%. How do they go about ensuring that that counts? Uh, who do they contact, etc.? Yeah, so uh, in the first instance, you need to contact the CSAC chair. You can always um, copy in any other member of the CSAC as well. So you can get to that page uh, by going to the subspecialty page, to the neonatal subspecialty page, or simply by Googling ne neonatal CSAC RCPCH and go to that page. Email um, the CSAC chair is Dr. Morai Campbell and just explain the experience that you've done and that you'd like to count it towards subspecialty training and they will reply with the, with the answer. And then um, if they approve your experience and you just have to attach that to your confirmation of eligibility form. Thank you. Um, uh... Questions at interview is another one that's popped up as well. Um, so the question is, are all the questions um, standard across or are there different questions? Um, and also I have answered in the chat, but there the was also asked whether the uh, all the people on the panel will be members of the subspecialty. And yes, they will all be consultants in whichever subspecialty you're applying to. But regards to the questions, are they all standardised with everyone having the same questions at interview? Uh, it won't be the same questions. No, the questions are relevant to the subspecialty uh, you've applied to, um, and they're also written by the CSACs. Um, so yes, they they are different for for each of the interview that each of the interviews that you've um, that you're going to. Yeah, the only one which will come across very similarly is the um, career 
sort of progress motivation style question. But obviously, as Eloise said, everything is very much sort of tilted towards the subspecialty you're applying for. Um, so question as well around, uh, so this is a fairly long question. I'll try and make it sound clear. Um, assuming we are working 100% full time and want to apply for a three year grid subspecialty, do the new rules mean we only get to apply twice, i.e. once in SD4 um, and once in SD5, with the SD5 year retrospectively counted? I think, Kay, you're going to take that and just uh, reiterate about sort of the length of specialty training for anyone around at the moment. OK, so first you to say if you're currently ST4, you're lucky because you could potentially apply three times if you're full time. So you could apply this round at ST4 if you think you're going to have met your level two competencies by your ARCP next summer. And if you find that you've been unsuccessful, you can then indicate that you want to remain in core for an extra year and you have to make that decision by March 23. This allows you time to see whether you've been successful at interview this year. So then obviously if you remained in core, you can apply again. Um, and then once you enter um, ST5, so your final three years of training, if you are applying in that round, then you'll want to be able to count um, competencies gained in your specialty training towards your subspecialty application. And you're only allowed to count 12 months whole time equivalent. So um, if you were to do that, you need to have you need to speak to your TPD to make sure that the post that you're placed in in ST5 as per progress plus are going to be potentially able to be counted um, towards training for subspecialty application. So I'd suggest, you know, that's about having a, you know, a open frank discussion with your um, your TPD or head of school, but also um, speaking to the relevant CSAC chair or training advisor to make sure the post that you're undertaking at ST5, so what would have been the equivalent of level three now, are appropriate and will be counted um, towards subspecialty training if you are successful at interview. Um, and we are looking if you know if you're intending to count um, count training um, before sort of entry to grid. Again, it has to be at currently at level three um, or at ST5 and above going forward from the transition to progress plus next year. Um, and you have to have sort of evidence that that has been approved by um, the CSAC at the time that you submit your eligibility form. So when you look on Kaizen and the eligibility form, you'll be able to see that you will be able to um, link um, and upload um, email correspondence from CSAC as evidence. Thank you, Kate, very helpful. Uh, another quick question for you on publications. I think we'll try and keep going until about five so we can get as many of these in as we can. Um, when anonymising a publication, does that mean just to mention the name of the publication or article and describe if first a author or role? Um, exactly. So ideally, we don't want to put your your name down as in the author list of the publication. Uh, and kind of on a similar sort of uh, similar sort of theme, really just talking. Somebody's asked about uh, if they're applying to more than one specialty with the, will the subspecialty interviewing know that uh, I've just popped in the chat that we would never share that. So um, certainly not as part of the process, but they know if you're applying to more than one. Um, let's just see if we've got a couple more that we haven't covered similarly. Um, if applying for larger specialties like neonates and it's scored by different individuals in different sections, does that mean any overlapping in certain sections like clinical experience and statement acceptable? Um, okay, you over, I, mean, I, I would say same. Uh, would, it's it's yeah. It's it's a good it's a good question, but essentially, you know, if you're in a, if it's a large subspeciality, um, you know, it may be that one panel of three people will mark the first three questions, um, and the other panel will mark the last four sections. But we do have um, wash ups. Um, the shortlisting wash up this year. So I would imagine if there's concern that there may have been duplication. So if, for example, in your QI section, um, 
you've probably that's the wrong way around but say in your sort of teaching section or in your research section you've predominantly talked about QI work then the people on the panel marking that section will probably check back with the other panel to make sure there's not been duplication um, and that would be done sort of in the shortlisting wash up. Thank you. Is there another quick question about research section. Can you score points on research that is ongoing slash not yet published? And I believe that's explained in the glossary, but yeah, so so yeah. so again, you know, you know, um, often the larger research projects, you know, they will take a few years. So you might be at the stage where you have, um, you know, designed it. You've got funding. You're actively recruiting. You, you've done some primary data analysis. So you know, you can include that in your in your sort of application. Thank you. Um, and quick question about teaching as well. Sorry, sorry, Kate. They're all coming to you. That's okay. Uh, Given the pandemic for the formal teaching course point, is it OK if the course has been online provided and it's CBD accredited? Yes, it is, because we appreciate that not all courses are face to face. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's quite a few questions sort of popping through about specific sort of uh, where people are in training and so on. I say because they are quite sort of personalised potentially, I think we'll leave you just to consult those um, documents we pop the link in the chat for if that's okay uh, and then if you have any questions that either yourself your TPD or your supervisor can't answer then by all means email us on the uh, subspecialty inbox um, uh, and can you score points on non-clinical research e.g publishing work for a med ed masters is the last one that's just come through uh, okay. Good question. Um, I suppose if it's research um, related to sort of teaching, education, um, medical sort of leadership, then yes, um, you know, that is acceptable. It doesn't all have to be purely sort of clinical research. But um, if you've done research, you know, on um, which is the best brand of X, Y and Z, so something totally unrelated to medicine, you're obviously not going to score there. Yeah, it's kind of all sort of relevance and uh, transferable uh, and relevance to the subspecialty is kind of the key. Um, I think that looks like the last of the questions. Hopefully we haven't missed any in amongst those. It suddenly came through in a big flurry at the end. But uh, as I say, we will be publishing this presentation, um, including the um, Q&A session on our YouTube channel. Um, and if there's anything that you can't sort of, uh, sort of work out looking at the links and so on and so forth, then Hopefully you know the uh, the email address at the end of the Q&A page there. We'll get back to you as quickly as we can. But uh, unless you have any closing remarks, Eloise, OK, I think we'll draw to a close. Just to say good luck in everybody's application. Yeah, I was just answering that there was a, a question. Is ST5 counted as level three in Progress Plus? I was just saying them. Um, uh, yes, under Progress Plus, ST5, six and seven is specialty training, which will be uh, so the terminology will change. Level three will be known as specialty training and uh, level one and two will be called core training. But just to add that if you're referring to counting experience gained at ST5 currently in progress, that cannot be counted. So anything that is currently ST5 experience um, or will be remaining core training um, next year, that cannot be counted as um, a subspecialty equivalent training. So essentially you have to have had your level two training signed off or your core training signed off to then count any subsequent experience. Thanks Kay, it's very very useful uh, just clarification there as well as we switch from one progress to a newer progress. Um, we've had a one last question which I'll squeeze in is just uh, can you explain again how you anonymize your name for publications as you need evidence just because that is always a bit of a, a which people find a little bit confusing. So apologies, um, Eloise might be able to help me on the technicalities of that, but we would just ex expect you to take um, your your name out of the authors of the publication. 
right. or not include the authors at all. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, thank you both and thank you to everyone that's, uh, that's attended. Hopefully that was that was very helpful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be coming back for a more sort of technical interview based webinar in early January on the 6th, I believe. Um, that will be published online soon so you can join it uh, and we'll therefore be going through more about kind of uh, using Osler um, following on from having practice and teams in the past but hopefully as I say that will make things a lot easier for everyone because you'll have one system and it'll also prep you on how to use it to start as well so um, take care everybody have a lovely Thursday evening and enjoy the rest of your week good luck with your applications indeed <laughs>